uh, I was in the Philippines for quite a number of months, like more than three months. And I just would like to thank all of you for the prayers that you have said in behalf of my family, my, my daughter and my son-in-law, Jason. Now they're, they're well. My daughter started to report uh, at work and uh, my son-in-law is going to report uh, probably at work next, next week. So praise God or he had answered our, our prayer. And it was not an easy experience for me being away from family, knowing that uh, some members, some of our members are affected by this coronavirus. Plus the fact that I was also sur uh, surrounded by, by people in Cebu and the news around uh, telling us that the virus is spreading wildly in the area. And one of the most unforgettable experience that I have relative to the infection of my, of, of my uh, daughter and son-in-law with coronavirus was one time when I was invited to attend a birthday celebration by one of our closest family friends. It was not expected that she, uh, uh, our friend, and her son, the eldest son, and her daughter-in-law, and her mother, after that celebration, was diagnosed to have, uh, to be positive with COVID-19. And uh, it's, it scared me a lot because, you know, human as we are, I was, I was with them. I was sitting beside uh, the old woman, the mother of our friend. Her age is 73. And uh, having close you know, conversation with uh, her son. After three days of celebration, after three days from the celebration, I received a call, a notification that uh, my friend, is diagnosed positive with COVID, her son, her sister-in-law, and likewise her mother. And two days after that, I was again informed that the son was brought to the hospital because uh, he had uh, that, uh, severe symptoms of COVID. And uh, after, I think one day, the mother also was rushed to the hospital. She had a hard time breathing. And unfortunately, she was not able to make it after staying in the hospital for more than a week. She died. And that uh, triggers anxiety on my part. And uh, I was having some sort of a symptom of COVID, like a sore throat. But I said to myself, this kind of sore throat has been here since, but now I wish that this is not COVID. So I decided with the persuasion of some of my friends in, in Cebu to subject myself to the swab test. So I went and after, after five days, I received a result and it was a good news. I was negative and I praise God for that. So I could just now reflect with what Jesus Christ had said to his disciples specifically in terms of pestilence as he mentioned as one of the signs of his second coming, the end of the world, and of course the destruction of Jerusalem when he was speaking with the disciples. This is a very familiar chapter for us, Matthew chapter 24, and it is worth uh, reflecting. And uh, once again, try to, uh, try to review and be refreshed of uh, the precious messages that uh, this chapter 20, 24 contains. You have noticed that Jesus Christ did not specifically uh, describe in a separate manner the events that uh, are connected with the second coming, the end of time, and the destruction of Jerusalem. Because the one that really 
uh, encourages his disciples after their experience with Jesus Christ in the temple and hearing him telling the scribes and the Pharisees that uh, your place is desolate. So when they were sitting there with him on top of the mountain of Olive, John, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they ask uh, this you know, familiar question to us. Um, in verse 3 of Matthew 24, now as he sat on Mount Olive, the disciples came to him privately. So the disciples said, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, according to Mrs. White in the Desire of Ages. And uh, they said, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of, of the world? So then there, Jesus started to tell them. But uh, surprisingly, Jesus Christ just told them the signs of the times. He did not give them the hour and uh, the day of his, of his coming. As evidenced in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, and Jesus, Jesus Christ said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but by my Father only. Although in some study it was said that the word uh, not known by angels and in the, in the book of Mark, even the Son of God, says that uh, the word not known should also be, could also be interpreted as not to make known. So in other words, uh, Jesus Christ, they, they said that angels probably have known, Jesus Christ have known the end, uh, the end of the world and, the, and his second coming, but he was, they were not given the authority to make it known to others. But even then, the point is here that nobody is allowed to time set. Nobody is allowed to tell that probably within five years the Lord is going to come or probably two years or three years from now Jesus Christ is going to, to come. So nobody is allowed. And neither anybody is allowed to say that uh, probably 10 years to 20 years uh, the Lord is not yet going to come. So that event is made close to us. We don't know. It's not keen to our understanding. It's hidden. Only the Father knows. But uh, what is important here is uh, their state of mind, the state of mind of the disciples after they have heard all this declaration of Jesus Christ. You know, as the angels revealed the messages to the disciples, we notice that the state of mind of the disciples relative to the second coming of Jesus Christ is always towards that his coming is very close. And even Jesus Christ himself, in Matthew 24, 33, when he made uh, this uh, metaphor about the fig tree, when he said, when you see all these things, know that uh, the end is near, even at the doors. So that's the frame of mind of, of Jesus Christ. And so with the disciples. And here are some verses in the Bible that will tell us that uh, how the disciples perceived about the second coming and the end of the world. First verse is found in Romans 13. Romans 13 verses 11 to 12. So the point being mentioned there, relative to the second, the perception about the second coming is that it says, now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 29, the point being stressed is that the time is short. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 and 17, Paul even perceived and have this concept that there will be among them a life during his time that will witness the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as, 
as <clears throat> evidenced by this statement. He said in verse 15, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them, the dead, that those are the dead in Christ which are asleep. And then in verse 17, he went on by saying that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So that's their, their state of mind relative to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is near. We ourselves can witness the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, The day is approaching. It is near. And in James chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, it says that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and the judge standeth even before the door. So the closeness of the second coming of Jesus Christ is really part of their expectation. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Peter said, The end of all things is at hand. So that is how they believe. And in Revelation chapter 22, 6 and 7, here's the angel showing, showing to his servants things to come. Things which must shortly be done. So shortness of time is being emphasized, emphasized here with regards to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 7, the word of the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. I come quickly. So thus, when you read also the spirit of prophecy, the writings of uh, the inspired author, Ellen G. White, he made, she made mention in the, late, in the last the event book, page 38, paragraph 3. Page 30, paragraph 3. In reference to the expectation of the disciples, the biblical writers, the New Testament uh, Bible biblical writers relative to the second coming of Jesus Christ, she said, Thus it was always been presented to me. So it was also presented to her that the coming of the Lord of Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ is very, very soon. An example of the statements I am going to give to you along with the year where this statement was written. The one here is in, uh, it says in Testimony, Volume 1, pages 131 to 133. And you can find this in the last day event book, page 36, paragraph 3. It says, I was shown, this is Mrs. White speaking, the company present at the conference said the angel, some food for worms, some subjects to the seven last plagues, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. So she maintained that kind of frame of reference relative to the second coming that it is near like that of the disciples of Jesus Christ, and even of Jesus Christ's uh, perception also about, about his coming. Another statement, oh, <clears throat> but by the way, this statement made by Mrs. White was written in 1856, 1856. And another statement found in volume Volume 3 of Testimony 159, written in 1872, but could be found in Last Day Event, page 36, paragraph 3. It says, Because time is short, we should work with diligence and double energy. Our children may never enter college. So see how she perceived the second coming, the nearness of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in 1876, she made this exhortation. It's not wise to have children now. So that was in her letter 48 in, 17, 
in 1876. She said, time is short. Time is short. And in 1885, 1885, the sin of earth history are soon to close. Fewer marriages contracted is better for all. That is in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 366. And in Review and Herald, dated July 31, 1888, she said, The hour will come. It is not far distant. We shall hear the voice of the archangel and the trump echo from the mountains. So it's just like that. It's just like that. But I believe that during the time, many people were also starting to be frustrated. Hearing upon this statement about the nearness of the second coming of Jesus Christ, and probably after reading verses of the scriptures that expresses the sentiment through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from the disciples that Christ is soon to return. People might be starting to doubt. And uh, the reason behind why there is a delay is found in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. So in other words, in, in God's side, He is really willing to come. But there, there is this reason behind why he did not come. Why Jesus Christ did not come yet. It says here, but God is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in connection with this statement of Second Peter, Mrs. White made this statement. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy, because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. If Christ had come during the disciples' time, I should not have this opportunity to be working with you, to be expecting for the return of Jesus Christ. Should Jesus Christ come during the time of the first early foundation of the church? We could not have this opportunity of fellowshipping one another. We will be excluded. We will not be among the candidates that will be having a privilege of enjoying life forevermore. But it's because of the mercy of God. I am going to give you an event that involves far away from our time today. This has nothing to do with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the statement from the spirit of prophecy is focused on Satan. Focus on on the time that the Lord has allotted for him to struggle for position in this world. And uh, the statement, I found this in The Great Controversy, page 673, paragraph 3. It says that Satan's work of ruin is forever ended. So this chapter is the last chapter of the great controversy. And uh, Mrs. White relayed the experience of the people of God, the experience of the sinners, experience of Satan after the 1,000 years. And after enumerating all these experiences, Satan, you know, trying to deceive once again those sinners that were resurrected by Jesus Christ, telling them, I was the one 
who bring you back to life. And now I am telling you, I am the rightful, the rightful owner of that city. And take note that our number exceeds exponentially with their numbers. And therefore, we can take back that city. So he tried to deceive. And according to, and according to the great controversy last chapter, this is the last final struggle of Satan against God. And there were a series of events that he acknowledges the supremacy of God and even bowing and acknowledge that God is just and right in his judgment. But because he, he is being a rebel, he cannot just hold himself, but to keep on pushing and trying to go against God. And then Mrs. White said that that experience when Jesus Christ with his throne on top, high on top of the holy city, made this seemingly panoramic view of the experience of Satan and those of the people, the, the sinners, and likewise of his suffering, and revealed that all these miseries are because of Satan and uh, the people, the sinners, were convinced that Satan is not the rightful leader. And they hated him. And they hated those individuals that were instrument in the hands of Satan in order to deceive them. And in, that, in this connection, when Satan, when they tried again to marshal their force to attack the city, God pronounced the judgment, he rained fire, and there were some of the sinners that right away died. Some stayed for days, and Satan stayed for a longer number of days, because all the sins of the righteous was also put on his head, and he suffered according to his work. So this is just an indication, this is just a revelation that in the punishment of the wicked, some will die right away, but some will linger a little bit longer and more time to suffer will be experienced of Satan because judgment will be meted according to the works that everyone have, have done. So, Mrs. White, so now he made this some sort of a summary, looking back. So she said, Satan works of ruin is forever ended. Forever ended. And she said, for 6,000 years, he has wrought his will, filling the earth with who and causing grief throughout the universe. So for me, this is just a very consoling statement that Satan, Satan is only given, only given 6,000 years. But the burden of the issue is when are we going to start counting the 6,000 years? Another statement from the Desire Pages, page 759, paragraph 3. It says there, Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in, Adamic place, in Adam's place. To bear the test, he failed. Here, Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf. 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. So what does this mean? So this statement is telling us that the 4,000 years span from the time when Adam was tempted by Satan. And it reaches to the time when Jesus Christ was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. So they call this the wilderness of temptation. Now the question is asked, what year was that? 
when Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. The Bible is silent. It did not mention any date. But there is a very significant event, very connected to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And that event is his baptism. After his baptism, he was tempted by, by the devil. And for sure, in our, in our study, we know that Jesus Christ at the age of 30 was baptized in year AD 27. Year AD 27. So that goes to show that year AD 27 would be the probable date that would give us to the 4,000 years from the time of Adam's temptation. But uh, I think also the spirit of prophecy is telling us that uh, there should be, we should not be dogmatic enough to pinpoint that 27 AD is uh, the exact date that made complete the 4,000 years from the time of Adam's fall. Because another statement in in Confrontation, the book of Ellen Jewett, Confrontation, page 32, paragraph 1, it says, Three and one half years after his baptism, so mean to say, after 27 AD, three and a half years have lapsed, our Lord was crucified. So when did Jesus Christ crucifixion? He was crucified, what year? In the year, the spring of 31 AD. So from the time of his baptism to the time of his crucifixion is three and one half years, according to, to the statement. Our Lord was crucified with great sacrifice offered upon Calvary. Ended that system of offering which for 4,000 years had pointed toward the Lamb of God. So here are two events that would probably fall within the 4,000 years from the time of Adam's fall. And one event is the temptation of Jesus Christ that happened in 27 AD and his crucifixion in 31 AD. Now, the question is, if, basing upon the 27 AD, that ends the 4,000 years, how many years more before the 6,000 years of Satan will be consummated? It's hard to determine because the last struggle of Satan to maintain position of earth was interrupted by the 1,000 years vacation in heaven of the saints and 1,000 years being in prison, you know, Satan being in prison here on earth. It is hard, but it is just simply telling us that the time is short. So this is still the sentiment being handed down to Elijah White. Yes, it is far distant from us, but we cannot just we cannot just tell that seven years from now, six years from now, the Lord is going to come. Relative to the end of Satan's struggle for supremacy of his position here on earth. There is a great temptation that people will immediately jump to that kind of conclusion that they will say, oh, probably the end of time or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will happen within six years from now. The Bible did not give us such kind of a message to proclaim. No, and we should not dare to do that. So I am just bringing this to you in order for you to be aware that there are people out there that is making the issue of 6,000 years of Satan's supremacy 
of Satan's struggle of supremacy here on earth, that they link it with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and immediately made the conclusion that probably within. The, the point here is that nobody knows. It is only God that knows when will be the time of his coming. We know that the Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But as the word of the Lord failed, never, Mrs. White said, it should be remembered that the promises and threatenings of God are alike conditional. We found that in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 and to 10. So his promises and his threatenings are conditional. And what are the conditions that would make, that would nail it to the point of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? One condition is found in Matthew 14, the preaching of the gospel to all. And this gospel shall be preached into all the world. That is one. And with regards to this, all of us has this opportunity and a privilege to be part of the workforce of proclaiming the gospel, the gospel of grace into all, into all the world. We have all part. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, verse 12, not only that we are told to be looking, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. In last day event, another condition, page 39, paragraph 2, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. He wanted to come, but he cannot. Mrs. White continued on, when the character of Christ shall be perfected and reproduced, in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. This condition number number two. Condition number one, proclamation of the gospel. Matthew 24, verse 14. Condition number two, Christ's character must be perfectly reproduced in his people. This is quite a challenge, but we can learn from the experience of David. When the time of his distress, when the time of his, his falling, when the time when he was considered to be a wounded soldier of Jesus Christ, where did he go? He turned to God and prayed this prayer, recorded in Psalm 51, verse 10 and onward, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and you renew the right spirit in me. So, brothers and sisters, we thank Jesus Christ that he has provided a solution to every condition that he, he set before us. We can always turn to the Father and pray in his name that the character of Jesus Christ will be perfected in our, in our hearts. And the three conditions, the third conditions, Recorded in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 208, written in 1882. It says, when figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences. So it seems to me that God has some sort of uh, a container where we can I, can, I can say that when the container is is full so that's it the container of iniquity is full he is going to commence his judgment the wrath of him will will commence and uh, what is this kind of what is this kind of uh, of activity that would really tell us that the judgment of God will take place. 
we can say that the cup of the evil ones are already full. That the time of probation has ended for them. It says, when it shall have become a law, that the transgression of the first day of the week shall be met with punishment, then their cup will be full. This is with reference to Revelation chapter 13. When violation of the first day of the week will result to the punishment, then the end will come. And God knows when will this event take place. So no one knows of his coming. He only, he's the only one that knows. Even the angels doesn't, doesn't know. Therefore, I would like to say again, no time setting. No time setting. Because we will always, we will always fail. Because Jesus Christ, at a time as you do not know, Jesus Christ will come. People might be able to make some uh, very convincing presentation in order to convince people that the end of the world will come this year, but it will always end up to failure. For such a, for such a time that you think not, the Son of Man will come. Nobody is given that authority to proclaim the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here are some of the suggestions, some of the counsels given by Jesus Christ in Matthew 24. He said in Matthew 24, verse 43, what's for the signs of the time? What's, therefore, he said, what's. He made all these signs of the times. He said to his disciples, rumors of wars, distress of nations, famine, pestilence. But Christ said, this is not yet the end. He said, this is just, these are just the beginning of source, but not yet, not yet the end. Second counsel, be ready. Matthew 24, verse 44. Be ready of what? Be ready. Because our adversary is the devil and seeking whom he may devour. And he is quite in an advantage point because uh, he's using our sinful nature. And therefore, now for us Christians, our greatest enemy is ourselves. And the greatest battle ever fought, according to the spirit of prophecy, is the battle against, against self. So we are admonished by Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and onward, to wear the armor of God. He said, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. In the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, so was the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and having the shod of for your feet with, a, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation coming as a grace coming from God and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So let's have all these implements of, of war put on in us. And the last counsel of Jesus Christ, he said, we have to pray. In connection with his disciples, with his family during the time Christ said, because you, the, you are going to be hunted by men, tribulation will come, people are going to kill you, and you are going to run away. Jesus Christ said, in connection with this, in Matthew 24, verse 20, but pray that your flight will not happen in winter, nor on Sabbath day. So, we, if we have fears about the future, Christ is just telling us, Pray. And Paul also 
supported this counsel of Jesus Christ in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 6. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying always. If we're confronted with physical issues, spiritual issues personally, who can help us except God? So where can, where can we go? Except to Him. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, He said. Jesus Christ made mention of this. And I would like to make this always fresh in my mind when Jesus Christ said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. So we are encouraged by Jesus Christ to pray. Bring everything unto Him in prayer. And I like the prayer suggestion of Mrs. White recorded in Steps to Christ. Page 70, she suggested that this should be our prayer every morning. Said, pray like this, take me as holy thine. I lay all my plans before thy feet. Use me today in your service. Abide with me and let all my works be wrought in thee. May the Lord of grace and mercy will help us to make it through while we struggle against self, against this human nature of ours, the fallen nature, I believe that the work of grace is going to finish in the heart of each one, cooperating with the work of the Holy Spirit. We will come out with a perfect character of Jesus Christ reproduced in us. Or in the words of St. Paul, we are encouraged that God who has started a good work in us is going to accomplish it. Let us all pray. Our Father in heaven, we would like to thank you for the message of Jesus Christ, for the counsels that he has given, and for the encouragement that you have shared with us in connection on how we are going to relate ourselves with regards to the second coming of your son Jesus Christ. Thank you for the admonition that we should not be time setter because the second coming of Jesus Christ is one of your mystery. We will just wait upon you. As we know, there will be some time that your voice will be heard after the del delivering of your people, announcing the hour and the day of the second coming of your Lord Jesus Christ. So help us always to be ready to pray and to watch. In Jesus' name, amen.